We made it. It's been a long week, a wonderful week for me, probably a little longer for you than for me. But we made it all throughout the week, and I don't want to take all evening telling you how thankful I am. I just want you to know that I very much am. This journey, I was thinking during that song, this journey has brought a great blessing to me. Never been to Bowling Green before, making a lot of new friendships, spending time together. I enjoyed our worship. I enjoyed your encouraging words, the time we spent together, the stories that we shared, the food that we enjoyed, the food that we enjoyed. I was appreciating that this podium like only blocks your trouble spot. You guys notice that? So that's why I'm up here, because dinner was filling and wonderful. Uh, your shepherds here are involved men who care about this group of people. Before I came, and this is something that rarely happens, a year or two before I got here, they had a, a conference call with me about why they thought that this week would be important and what they wanted accomplished. And last week we checked in again, went through the topics together. They are involved, and it means a great deal to me to be entrusted with you having a place at my feet so that I teach you and then get on a plane and leave. And I do not take that lightly, and I want to thank the elders here for allowing me to do that. Uh, you got a couple good preachers here. You know, I could go, it's kind of like the last night where you just go on and on about how great they are. I'm not going to do that. But Mike and Eric are wonderful men who love God's word and love this church. And I see so many wonderful, optimistic things, not just in this congregation, but among the Christians all throughout this area. Just a wonderful pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Tonight, I don't have notes or anything. We're just going to be in Matthew 25. If you would open your Bibles to Matthew 25, we have a little less time. Uh, and I know that, you know, the secret to being invited back is you've got to keep it short on the last night. I mean, that's in, like, the preacher manual. Uh, and so, I, you know, I rarely return to places. But Matthew 25, we're going to read the words of Jesus tonight. While we're getting there, I think I want to approach this text in this way, by asking you a question. Are you familiar with the term salvation issues? You're probably really familiar with that term. It's not exactly a Bible term. But it's a term that we use a lot, and you know exactly what that term means. When we start talking about salvation issues, we're talking about the big stuff. We're talking about the stuff that if you do it, you can go to heaven. And if you don't do it, you cannot go to heaven. If it's something sinful, we're talking about the things that if you choose to live in it, you cannot go to heaven. And if you choose to leave it behind, then you can. The Bible teaches us about issues like this very explicitly in Scripture. I'll give you one. Believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. No one is going to heaven if they do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We'll die in our sins. That is a salvation issue straight from Scripture. The first words Jesus said in his ministry was to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If there's sin in your life and you turn from that sin, you can be saved. If you don't turn from that sin, you cannot be saved. Salvation issue, it'll make all the difference in the world. I believe baptism in water is a salvation issue. Because the Bible teaches that that is the place where you have your sins washed away, where you put on a relationship with Jesus and how you are added to the church. Immorality is a salvation issue because the Bible clearly tells you that those who continue to live in immoral behavior can't be in the kingdom of God. If you're not in the kingdom of God, then you cannot be saved. If I give everybody a sheet of paper tonight and I said, I want you to flesh this out and write out all of the salvation issues. The in or out issues, the up or down, we would list a lot of the same things. I think you would probably list all the things I just listed, and maybe you'd list some more things. But can I also say, our list might not all look the same. Is that a fair statement? Like, we would have a lot of the same things, but, you know, you might have a few things on your list that aren't on my list. And I might have a couple of things that I think, biblically, are heaven or hell issues that aren't on your list. And you know what? That's all we're talking about. I think we should be able to openly discuss those things because ultimately we got to get to Scripture and find out like who's going to heaven and who isn't and what the Word says. It's important that we discuss all those issues, but I need to make something very clear tonight. There is only one person who decides if you are saved or you are lost. And that person is Jesus Christ. No one else decides that. You don't decide if you're saved or lost. Jesus does. 
The preacher doesn't decide if you're saved or lost. Your family doesn't decide if you're saved or lost. And eldership doesn't decide if you're saved or lost. Some guy who writes a bunch of articles and puts them in a magazine does not decide if you're saved or lost. Jesus is the ultimate decision maker on who's in and who's out. And one day he's going to show up and everybody's going to see it. Matthew 25 is where we'll be. It's the only place we'll be. And the text says in verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one another. Jesus will do the separating. As the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Verse 34, the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus is going to make that decision. Verse 41, he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. You answer to Jesus. And what he says goes. Now, again, it's great to hear sermons, read articles, have conversations. But it would seem to me that if the voice of Jesus is going to determine where you go forever, you should be basically addicted to the teachings of Jesus. You should be drawn to it every day in every way until you can basically memorize his words. What I would like to say to you as I get ready to leave, and I'm flying out tomorrow, you don't have to look at me again. I'm flying out tomorrow. But I want you to understand, we need to be hearing the words of Jesus now because one day you're going to hear his words whether you're ready or you're not. I would go this far as to say that every child of God, this is the whole New Testament, really Old and New Testament, all of it together, but specifically tonight, every child of God who believes that they will face Jesus, should be reading the Gospels through every year. I mean, I'm going to push it a little further. Like, I don't know if you're taking that moment seriously. If you're going through an entire year of your life without reading the actual, spoken, authoritative, divine words of Jesus. Because you know what Jesus is going to do if you read him? He's going to tell you what the salvation issues are. He's going to tell you exactly how the final day is going to go and exactly how to prepare for it. And I'm going to show that to you tonight in just a few minutes in Matthew chapter 25. We've already seen that he comes in and says, I'm coming. My word counts. I will separate everyone. Many will be lost, he tells us in Matthew 6, and, and few will be saved. And then in the text, he says, I'm going to tell you exactly who's who. You really want to know tonight? You're really interested to know, beyond just what you think or what's common in the church where you worship, you really want to know who's in and who's out because Jesus is just going to tell you. And that's what we're going to read. There are three stories, three pictures in Matthew 25, and I'd like to finish the week focusing on the words of the one whom I will hear from in the end. Let's look at these three stories. Go back to Matthew chapter 25, and I'll go ahead and read this one. It's not too long. 13 verses, Matthew 25. This whole text is about being ready when Jesus comes. That's what the whole chapter is about. Look in verse 1. He said, The kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. He said, Five of them were foolish and five were wise or prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy, they began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all of these virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, We can't, no, there, there won't be enough for us and for you. You need to go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. A lot of scrambling going to happen on that last day. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then is the point, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Okay, what is Jesus teaching us about when he comes? He's saying, you want to know what a salvation issue is? Listen very carefully. When I come back, and this isn't in the text, but it's obvious in his teaching, and then we'll get to the text. 
It's obvious Jesus is saying, when I come back, there will be people who never even started their lamp. They never put oil together. They never got ready. They never thought it was important to get ready. And they were not at the door when I came. And that's a salvation issue. They're going to be lost. But he said there are others, maybe we know more about this, who do want to be saved and who have trimmed their lamp and that their little light is shining and, and they want to be in. But the problem is they didn't know how to get prepared and stay prepared. There are people in the church today who really need the timing to be right in order to be saved. If the Lord comes on a Sunday, I'm probably in. If the Lord comes on a Tuesday afternoon, who knows? Just depends on what week it is. If the Lord comes this year, there's no way. I'm totally out of focus, and I'm in the depths of despair. But if the Lord comes next year, then I'll be ready. Jesus said, you want to know what a salvation issue is? I am only going to save people who prepare and over-prepare and stay prepared. Does that make sense to you? That's a salvation issue. Not the people who need to time it, and we all have sin and things that drag us down and we wane and we go in and out. But he's only going to save those who say, whenever you want to come, it's when you want to come, and it doesn't matter when you come or what day you come, I am surrendering to always be prepared. So the question is, are you the kind of disciple who gets prepared, over-prepares, and stays prepared? Now, you might say, well, how do I define that? How do I know if I'm one of those people? I think you know, but I'm going to help you figure it out. I want you to imagine that there's a new convert that comes up to you. Don't we love new converts? Is there anything better in the world than a brand new Christian who's in love with what Jesus has given them? A brand new convert comes up to you and they say, you know, I've been reading this story. And, and I want to make sure that I've got oil in my lamp. I don't want to be one of these people who's kind of ready, but I'm not really ready, and then I'm panicking when he comes. I want to be somebody who's ready. So a new convert comes up to you and says, how do I make sure I've got the oil? Because I want oil in flasks. I want oil like in a backpack. I want to fill my bathtub with oil. I want to have like an oil pond out back. Like I want so much oil that my fire will always burn. That's the kind of question a new convert might ask you. Let me just ask you something. If a new convert asked you, how do I over-prepare, what are you going to tell them? What would you tell them? Here's what I think you would say. You would say, well, check it out. One thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to read the word every day. Every day. You, can you hear yourself telling a new convert that? You want confidence? You're going to need to read the word every day so that you're ready every day. You're going to want to talk to God every day so that you can receive his mercy every day. You're going to want to find a body local of believers and integrate yourself in so that you are always nourished with Christian relationships. Don't just stop in and stop out. Don't just show up and go home. Don't bounce around. Find a home and get, do you hear yourself saying that? Like this new convert scared to death. That's your answer. And every morning when you get up, you're going to want to do your best that day to be more like Jesus. Okay, so back to you. Forget the story. No new convert asking you today. Question, if a salvation issue is being over-prepared and always prepared, what kind of life should you be living? You ready for a big surprise? Got your pencil handy? Read the word of God. Every day. Talk to God and entrust your life to him every single day. Find a local church and get integrated with people who will love and support you and wake up every morning and try to be more like Jesus. We haven't talked a lot about it this week, but worshiping at the right church that worships in the right way and baptizes for the right reasons and carries out the right kind of work, that is all really important stuff. But do you think that's going to make up for your empty lamp? You don't believe that. Please tell me you don't believe that. We know exactly what this salvation is. I'm not saying it's the only one. There are others that can be discussed, but I'm saying nothing can matter unless we are these five wise virgins. He said, let me tell you a second story. 
Matthew 25, he said, I want you to be prepared, over-prepared, so you're always prepared on a day-to-day -day basis. Then he comes in and tells a story that I think we know pretty well. I won't go through all of it. It's the parable of the talents. He says, all right, let me give you another one. He says, it's just like verse 14, a man who goes on a journey and he calls the slaves. And verse 15, he gives one five talents and one two and another one. Now, we know what the first two guys did. The text says, immediately, it's a very important word, immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded them and gained five more. Immediately gained. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. You know the good part of this, the master comes back and the guy's from five to ten and the master's pleased. And the guy from two to four has pleased the master because it's about, it's about direction. God's about direction over position and they both gain the same amount. You say, Chris, you must be from Texas. That's not the same amount. They both gained 100%. They took what they had and they doubled it in the name of the Lord. But then we come to this final one, and it says in verse 24, Master, I knew you were a hard man. You reap where you don't sow, you gather where you scatter no seed. I was afraid, and I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, wicked. It's not like he went and wasted it on worldly things. He was just doing nothing. He was scared and hiding and hunkered down and holding what he's got and trying not to go backwards. He said, he didn't say you very conservative minded protected, he said you wicked, lazy slave. You knew this, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Therefore you ought to have put my money in the bank and on my arrival I would receive my money back with interest. So they took the talent from him and they gave it to the one who has 10 talents. What's the salvation issue there? What's a true decision on who is saved and who is lost? When Jesus comes back, there will be church growers, church goers who are growing. We got any ING Christians? Tell me there are at least a handful of ING Christians in here. You know, you've got your ED Christians, where it's all past tense. I served and loved and traveled. And then you have kind of the ones that are just, I don't know, they don't really have any direction. They're just like nouns or verbs. But then you have ING Christians. They're growing, learning, exploring, investing, reaping. He said, you want to know what a salvation issue is? When I come back, there will be people with dirt under their fingers because they were sitting on what they had. And there will be those on the move. I'm just telling you, there's no, there's no substitute for that. This uh, one talent man just really interests me because I think I was that way a lot in my past. I think members of the church are kind of that way. We're so scared of him, like fear, terror. I mean, John says perfect love casts out fear, but some of us maybe don't get it. So I'm so scared of doing the wrong thing. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I do the wrong thing? What if I mess up? We're so scared of problems with our progress that we just don't do anything. And because of our fear, we will be captured by it and we will be lost. The fear. People say it's always great to fear God. Just yes. But if your fear has petrified you, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm not going to do any more than what I'm doing. I'm just going to keep sitting in my pew right here. And maybe, just maybe it'll all be okay. It's not going to be okay. This is a salvation issue. So what I want to challenge you with is we leave this week, we've talked about missions of mercy, we've talked about going to Zacchaeus in the tree or helping the guy on the side of the road. I want you to understand that there's no substitute for growth, exploration, and change. Change in the truth and in growing. Now, again, you might say, well, what does that really look like? I mean, I love the idea of growing, you know, excel still more, whatever, but like, what does it really look like? So let me just ask you again. What if a new convert came up to you, brand new Christian? So excited to be here. And they said, you know, I was reading this story. And I thought, what if, what if, what if I bury this? What if I bury my talent? And the Lord comes back and I didn't waste it, but I didn't do anything with it. How can I make sure that I grow, I keep growing, and I'm growing when he gets here? What would you tell that new convert? I don't know what you would say, but I would say something like this. I would say, you know what, let's go sit down and let's find out what your gifts are. 
You think new converts have gifts? How many of you think new converts probably have been gifted by God to do amazing things? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sit down and we're going to find out what you are uniquely gifted to do. And then we're going to put together a plan of how you can work that. And, I love this idea, we're actually going to find you some mentors in the church. Some people who share that gift with you. Who are also doing a really good job of planting and investing and growing. And then we're going to start doing something in April of 2027. So you can really think it out. Who would say that? We're going to start growing... Once you get past this initial church faith, like we would tell them immediately, let's start exploring what you can do. And so I think that there are a lot of people in a church like this that maybe look at me and think, well, am I growing? Am I changing? Well, let me tell you something. If you ask me that today, you know what I would tell you? I would say, let's go sit down and explore your unique spiritual gifts. Can I just ask you, do you know what your unique spiritual gifts are? Do you know what you're particular Romans 12, like, do you know what you're particularly good at? Make a plan of how to invest that and work with that. Find a few mentors here who are really good at that, and then start doing those things. Man, when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a lot of people who go to churches just like this, who heard sermons like this and thought, one day, one day I'm going to go in the backyard and I'm going to dig up that talent and I'm going to do something with it. People who one day are going to finally start engaging their gifts, are certainly still going to have it buried in the yard when Jesus gets back. You know that's the way it works. So what we want to do is we look at this and we go, okay, Jesus, what are salvation issues? He says, get ready, oh, like totally over-prepared, you'll be prepared. Find your gifts, explore how to grow them, start immediately, and when I get here, fruit will be bearing on the tree. That's the second thing. Now let me get to the third and final thing. Jesus said in verses 31 through 33 that he's coming. And he said when he does, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Now we have a lot of ideas on what the list is going to be that he's going to check down to decide where to put you. What's that salvation issue list? Well, you did this, you didn't do that. I'm just going to read this for you. And I'm going to tell you before I read it, I'm almost done. What I'm about to read for you is the most frightening passage for me in the entire New Testament. It's scarier than weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's scarier than the eternal fire or being away from God forever. There is no passage that has alerted me to change like this passage and has helped me transform. I am not transformed, but I am transforming. Can I read it for you? Just listen carefully. Jesus said, I'm coming to judge. You want to know what the salvation issues are? Check this out. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in, your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in and naked and clothe you? When were you sick or in prison and, and we came to you? The king will answer and say to those, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine. We'll talk about brothers in a moment. Even the least of them you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, and I don't know who's going to be on his left. There's probably going to be some churchgoers on his left. There's probably going to be some people who are baptized for the forgiveness of their sins on his left. There's going to be people who go to great churches. They're doing it right. And they're going to be completely shocked. Why am I on the left? The left is bad. I always knew the left was bad. How did I end up over here? They're going to be yelling out to the Lord. And the Lord's going to say, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. And they're not going to know why. He said, I'll tell you why. I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will say themselves, they will come together and answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick? Certainly we would have done all those things for you. He 
You will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you didn't do it to one of the least of the one of the least of these, whoever these are in this text, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal fire. remember that sermon too much growing up. I think that it was preached. I just, I don't remember. Do you remember that? Do you, do you remember that? Do, do you ever wonder if, if Jesus is serious about that? That was a terrible thing. Jesus is always serious. But like, what if he's really serious about that? Have you thought about that? What if he comes back and he says, you know what? You're a baptized believer, Gerald, baptized believer, Chris, Mr. Johnny, baptized believer. You guys are baptized believers. But you know what we're going to do? And Jesus, I'm not saying he's going to do this, but he could. He said, you know what? We're going to throw out everything else. We're going to throw out your stellar worship record. I'm not saying he's going to do that. He loves it when you come to worship. But you know what, I, you know what I've decided? I'm Jesus. I've decided that all I'm going to go by is in the last six months of your life, who you fed, who you invited in, who you helped, who you gave your clothes to, who you gave spirituality to. I put a, I put a short man in a tree at your job. Did you go talk to that guy? He was sick in a different way. I put a guy in a ditch beside you. Where did you go? Now, people debate about this, and I, uh, I pick the brains of preachers everywhere I go, elders, about who these brothers are. And I'll tell you the way that I think that it is. I think the brethren here is effectively whoever God chooses to put in your life who has needs. You say, well, I think this is just Christians. Well, here's the way I see it. I see it as circles that go like this. Probably the immediate context of Matthew 25 are suffering Christians. Disciples, not yet Christians in the church, but disciples of Jesus who are being thrown in prison for their faith, who are being burdened, who are hungry. You see Christians in need, saints first. You go and you help those Christians. I think it, it ends up meaning all disciples. If God puts a Christian in front of you who's hungry, if God puts a Christian in front of you who needs clothes, if God puts a Christian in front of you who's thirsty, go out of your way and give them what they need. But I don't think it ends there. Brothers here could very much just be referencing the, the neighbors, the brotherhood of Jews, the people, the bowling green knights. I don't know, I'm guessing. And, and, you know, it wouldn't be abnormal if that's what he means because he did say to love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm pretty sure that's everybody. And when he told the story of the Good Samaritan, he wasn't just talking about disciples. He was talking about some stranger in a ditch and the Levite and the priest, the holy ones, who walked right by. They walked right by. It's like, Levite, salvation issue in the ditch. And he's like, no, salvation issue in my piousness. No, it's not. It's over here in the ditch. We have other verses uh, like James 1. Are you familiar with James 1, 27? Did you know that James 1, 27 is the only verse in the New Testament that pictures religion in a positive way? Did you know that? There's mention of religion all kind of around the New Testament. It's usually about Pharisees and their messed up religion. But the only time it's said positively at all, the only time the Bible says, hey, religion is good, check this out, is James 1.27. Anybody know what pure and, defiled unre or pure and undefiled religion is? What is pure and undefiled religion? To visit widows and the fatherless in their distress. When the Lord puts people in front of us who need help, it's because he wants us to, it almost sounds too obvious, should I say it? Help them. When they don't have help, we help them. You say, well, what do you mean? And there's somebody out there going, what do you mean? Like, I gotta, there's homeless people. I got to drive and pick them all up and take them all home. I mean, sure, I guess. But I think more to the point is God puts people right in front of you. Like, there they are. God weaves them into your life. He brings them near your house. He puts them in your circle. And what he's expecting us to do are good things. It's a lot like the Galatians 6 verse, which is about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things. He says in Galatians 6, he said, you've got to do that to Christians. But he said, actually, I want you to do that for everyone. This passage doesn't haunt me like it used to because I'm praying about it and I'm working on it and I'm growing. But for a long time, I wondered, what if he throws out my attendance record, my incredible collection of ties my ability to quote scriptures 
I preach him all the sermons. He says, I just want to talk about the people I put right in front of your face. That I promised would find help if they found a disciple. Because to the extent that you helped them, you helped me. You know what this is called if that hits you in the heart? And names start to come to mind. And you can actually picture people. You know what it's called to have a heart for them and to want to go after them? You know what it's called? It's called Missions of Mercy. And that's how we began this whole week. May the Lord send us on Missions of Mercy. We are here because you are a vessel made and remade by the Lord so that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that God can pour forth of the Spirit into the lives of every single person who needs you. May we be a people like that. May it define who we are. Because to that extent, we're ready for Jesus. Salvation issues. You remember them? Let's see. Prepare, over-prepare, and stay prepared. Figure out what God has gifted you and grow in it and keep growing in it and grow straight through the finish line. And have your eyes open to undefiled religion. Only time it's spoken of positively. Your individual Christian responsibility to give of your gift, time, money, energy, faith to whoever God puts in front of you. That's the way churches grow. That's the way the kingdom grows. Because those are the people who are in it. And that's who I want to be. If you're ready for Jesus coming, then be an encourager to others. But if you're not ready for Jesus to come, if the timing isn't right, then I encourage you to look at this chapter and obey these ideas. And if we can help you, we want to encourage you. And if you're not a child of God, if you have not yet obeyed the gospel, can I invite you to start a journey, an inheritance, and a blessing? that will define your life, and maybe you can become one of those new converts that doesn't need to necessarily become more like us. Maybe we need to become more like you. We want to see that fire burn in a soul that knows that they're saved. I hope that's what your soul is doing. If not, let us help you. Together we stand and sing.